And next up, we have Julian Penders of Bloom Technologies. Welcome to the stage. Julian, please. Hey. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Julian. I'm a co-founder and CEO of uh, Bloom Life. Bloom Life is a consumer health uh, startup based out of uh, San Francisco. We dedicated to connecting wearable devices with uh, predictive analytics to provide peace of mind and well-being to pregnant moms and their babies. So today, the talk is going to be about bringing clinically accurate data in the hands of consumers for the first thousand days of life, which is what has been uh, occupying my days for the last two and a half years, I guess, most of the time. Um, so having a baby is, is life-changing. Um, I have two kids. It has changed my life in many aspects, including moving all the way from Belgium to San Francisco to start a company, leaving everything behind me. So it has changed that part. It also has changed a lot the way I look at the world. So just like how many of you have kids here? Just to get an idea. OK. So you probably all, when you think of your kids, you probably all remember like something that has changed when they, when they came to the world. And this is great. But what we don't realize is that for too many people, uh, having a, a kid is associated to a lot of emotional problems, is a lot of health problems also. One of the leading um, pregnancy complications is preterm birth. Preterm birth affects 15 million babies over the world, out of which 1 million will die from consequences of preterm birth. That actually makes preterm birth the number one killer of children under the age of five years old. And if you look at what we've done in that space, in the space of prenatal health in the last 40 years, it hasn't evolved much. If you compare the evolution that we've seen in tech areas, such as smartphones, to the evolution that you've seen in the uh, obstetric space and the prenatal space, there's literally been no technology innovation in that space since 1971, when uh, people came with this non-stress test monitor. No innovation. At Bloom Life, we believe that mom deserves better, and we spent the last two years developing a clinical-grade uh, wearables combined with predictive analytics that can be used as a convenience of an app to provide a comprehensive prenatal health management platform. So just to, get, to set a bit of context, what I want to do in the last uh, 10 minutes is to kind of take you through the journey of uh, building a clinical-grade wearable targeted to pregnant moms. And the first question you may ask is, like, why, why do you want to build a clinical red wearable? Aren't there enough wearables out there that you can just take, use, and, and leverage for your own application? Well, that's true. It's true there is a lot. There's been a wearable revolution since, I would say, 2008, since it started. There's been devices to measure a whole lot of different things. Uh, it's shown that consumers have an increasing engagement in using those wearable technologies for their health, would it be for monitoring fitness and well-being, or more like to follow um, and to monitor chronic conditions. We've also seen an increased engagement from doctors, and there was a recent survey, um, well, recent from 2014, where it's shown that uh, close to 80% of, of physicians say they would rely on wearable device to help in their diagnostics. So there is also uh, acceptance of those technologies in the medical space. However, those devices today have quite some limitations. And if someone asked questions before about like, the limitations of the wearable, I think the first thing is that the data they provide is still very limited. It's, it's a lot, and we talked about, we talked about activity. We've seen in the last two years some more information about pulse and the heart rate, and we talked about this today. But still very limited data. It's limited data that also lack accuracy. There's been some, some studies before. This is, this is a pretty old study for like two years ago, but I like it because it really shows the limitation of this. These are four activity trackers. Uh, the output you see on the Y scale is the um, calorie um, burned, basically, for different activities. You can see that there is all the way up to a factor of eight difference between the output you get from those four different devices. Eight times different. So that speaks a lot about the accuracy of those technologies. They also fail to engage people. There are famous studies that like, uh, monitor the dropout rate um, of people using wearable, and clearly there is, there is a problem in engaging users in a sustainable manner over time to keep tracking their health with those wearables. And also, I think we need to realize that there is questionable medical value. And there has been a lot of studies trying to see whether we can use that wearable data. And I think we've seen some good examples today. So I think this is changing. But if you look at fitness trackers in particular, I think it's, it's people are, are having a hard time uh, validating and providing evidence for the medical value of those wearables. 
So that has pushed a lot of people to look at what's next. So how do we make wearable better? Like how do we change this? And that's a term that some people will have called like wearable 2.0, and everybody comes with their own, own definition of wearable 2.0. Some people will say, well, it's going to be more in the fashion industry. You've got to make them very different, intuitive, compatible, and they have to be fashionable so that you drive engagement. That's one approach. Some other people will say this is more in the workplace. So you're going to have to develop wearables to help people uh, uh, working in different companies, and that's really more a workplace uh, approach. Some people will say you've got to team up with pharma. Wearables are going to be used with pharma in combination with pharmaceuticals, in combination with drugs. It's going to be a more holistic view of uh, healthcare. Some other people think that wearable 2.0 will be about providing more accurate data. It uh, will be more about health. It will be actionable, and it will be linked, integrated into the healthcare system. That's where we think that the future of wearable will be. We think that the future of wearable will be in providing clinical grade data and put that in the consumer hands so that consumers can make better information about their health and well-being. So what I, there, there are a lot of things that we need to achieve to get there. I just want to highlight four points that I think are important. The first one is that we need to, to increase uh, the breadth of data that we're collecting. We need to go to more relevant and actionable information, more data, but smaller data. You have examples of companies that are taking this way. I'm taking just a few examples here. Scanadu is, is developing this technology scout that um, measures multiple parameters and provides a more holistic picture of their health. Another example is, a, is some effort that, that was done by Samsung um, a couple of years ago by providing 13 different sensors in a wristwatch. Again, it's really about increasing the width of the data. But that's not sufficient. You have more data coming in, but you need to process it to make it smaller and actionable. And there are a couple of companies that are really working on simplifying, so going broader in terms of the data you collect, but simplifying in terms of how you can interpret it, simplifying for the user. In this case, for example, coming or summarizing the data into one number, or even summarizing the data into recommendations for actions that you can take. So broader data at the basis, converging into simpler information to be uh, actioned by the user. Second thing, we need to move away from, from this limited accuracy, and we need to uh, be open uh, to more benchmark. We need to be open to more standards. Consumers deserve to know that the technology they're using is accurate, because they're going to base their uh, health decision on it. They're going to base their well-being decisions on it. So they need to know. And it's interesting to see like a company like Apple, this was in the news a couple of months ago, actually last year, uh, where it, they're doing a lot of, there is a lot of effort which is put in validating that, uh, the Apple Watch. And we saw the results, I and mean, we saw a lot of interesting examples of what you can do with the Apple Watch. The Apple Watch has been validated against uh, uh, standard systems that are used to measure uh, calorie burn. So it's really in, in, increasing the bar in terms of accuracy, in terms of validation. Third, we need to look at uh, real consumer needs. We need to go away from the short-lived engagement that tracking my steps provide me. We need to look at real consumer needs. And those consumer needs, I would say, evolve over life. Right? So when you're pregnant or when you're going to have a kid, as a dad, you have questions. As a future mom, you have questions. This is a specific series of needs. When you have uh, um, delivered, when you have your baby, you have young kids, you have other questions. Then you go on with life, you may get diabetes, you may have other chronic diseases, and eventually you are the elderly part of life. These are different life cycles, and those different life cycles have their own questions, their own challenges. We need to look at solving specific questions and specific needs that people have, and we need to recognize that those needs evolve over time. They're not the same across the entire lifetime. Finally, we need to deliver clinical value, and clinical value will need to go through recognizing that value for using certification, for example, FDA or other regulation. Uh, it will need to go through the integration with healthcare systems. And there's been uh, interesting studies, that actually have quite a few wearables taking that leap, going through FDA with their wearables. And beyond just getting a medical approval, it's actually giving a stamp of accuracy. It's giving a stamp, it's giving a message to the medical community that yes, you can rely on the data measures with my wearable in order to make your decisions. So at Bloom Life, we, we've done all, all that, focused on one very specific part of the life, which is the first 1,000 days of life. We developed a clinical grade sensor that tracks the health of mom and baby from conception to birth. We measure parameters of the mom and parameters of the baby. On the mom's side, we measure activities, stress, calories uh, burned, heart rate. Uh, we also measure contractions at the end of pregnancy. On the baby side, we measure fetal movement, and we measure kick counts. 
We provide all that information to the mom in an app so she can get uh, this information provides peace of mind and she can make a more informed decision about her health, her well-being, and eventually the health of her baby. But this is really just the beginning. What we're after here is through the help of the users using that system, it's collect the most comprehensive data set that has ever been collected around prenatal health. We're going to aggregate thousands and thousands of data from moms and babies. And that's where wearable meets data science. That's where using artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques, we can start analyzing this consumer-generated data to find new knowledge that will help in understanding and improving the way we do prenatal care. Right? And this is, of course, like this is something that we hear a lot today. It's actually happening. We've had a couple of hundred users as part of a beta program. What you see here, it's a physiological heat map. What you see, every row is a mom. And the data we're tracking is physiological information about her contractions. So the, more dark, the darker the dot, the more contractions you're having. So when we do that, we can really crowdsource that information and understand how we may be able to predict onset of labor uh, in the future. And we actually have pretty good results that will be published uh, next, year, next year, early uh, January, in, a, in the Society for Maternal and Fetal Medicine Congress. So we show it's possible. It's possible to use consumer-generated data, applying machine learning uh, techniques and, and data science, and extract new information uh, that has impact for the mom. So this is, this is the beginning. We're in there. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today to talk about what we do and definitely open for collaboration. This is a completely open space. There hasn't been a lot of innovation. There is a lot to research, a lot to discover. So if uh, that's a space that interests you, please come and find me. I'd love to discuss about possible collaboration and um, keep this discussion going around uh, well-being. Thank you. We have time for questions, Johnny. Yes? OK, two minutes, two and a half minutes. The gentleman uh, over here, Martin. Uh, is your device 510K clear? That's it. So it's, uh, it's not clear today, no. So the, uh, the, the product as we sell today is a consumer product. So it's not, it's not clear. It doesn't mean it hasn't been clinically validated. So I think these are two different things. So we did all the clinical validation against technical, uh, against clinical reference, but we haven't gone through the 510K process. Not yet, at least. Yes, most likely, yeah. And the lady Hi. in pink? Could hey. you talk to us about uh, the, your, I mean, eventual conversation you had about this wearable with the FDA, or if, if you are considering a regulatory path? So, um, so we, we are considering a regulatory path. It's too early for us to engage with the FDA. The device as we sell today is a consumer product. It's just a contraction tracker. That's how we uh, market it as well. Um, we are gathering data now to be able to unlock a diagnostic, well, at least perhaps a, um, a more medical value prop in the future. Um, and then when time is right, we'll definitely go and, and, and engage with the FDA. But it's just too early for us right now. Uh, but I do think this is the way wearables should, should go. So I, as I say here, I think it, there is a lot of value in engaging with uh, regulation. And FDA is also doing a lot of effort on their side. I mean, you've heard about like the medical wellness um, guidance. So there is a lot of effort also on the FDA side, which I think it's a, it's a great sign that there will be this convergence between well-being and health. At some point, we're going to meet. Right? We're going to meet between well, uh, health care or well, wellness care and sick care. There is a transition between those two, and I think that goes from both worlds. Thank you very much, uh, Julian. I'll get the clicker from you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank Take you. care.